Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Coca-Cola. By Cook Inlet Region Incorporated, an Alaska Native Corporation promoting economic and social progress for people throughout the state. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by the Alaska Commercial Company, Alaska's leading retailer of food, family apparel, and general merchandise in remote Alaskan communities, with continuous service since 1867. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by the Public Information Office of the North Slope Borough. under one sky. With separate languages and ways, we are the heartbeat of Alaska. We open our hearts to you and welcome you to Heartbeat Alaska. Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Jeannie Green bringing you native news across the north. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, today I'm sitting here with John Tedpon. Shirley Goldie from Kotzebue sent us a native feast. We have seal oil and dry fish and salmon berries and blueberries and lots and lots of smoked fish and all kinds of goodies. Smoked salmon. Smoked salmon. A few stories ago, Judy Fisher from Knack set a table for me, so we decided to share this with everybody. Actually, if the truth were known, we just could not wait, and we broke out the good food right here. So please bear with us. I want to break out your native food, and we'll all have some together. On today's program, we go to the North Slope for the North Slope Borough News. KYUK TV in Bethel brings their news. We're glad to see them this week. They weren't here last week. We also visit University of Alaska Fairbanks, where Dennis Eames brings us a story on last week's Festival of Arts. But before we go to Gary Fife and his news, I'd like to thank Kay Thomas and Chris from University of Alaska Rural Student Services. They did me a big favor. We were almost not able to get our show on the air in Fairbanks, but they ran to the airport, picked it up, and got to them in time. Thank you very much. I'd also like to say hello to Bob and Ella Gertler in Seattle. I understand that they are from originally from Dillingham. They are the grandparents of Debbie Wilson, and Debbie has to tape the program every single week and send it down to them. Well, hello, Bob and Ella Gertler. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully, you'll see us on King TV down there one of these days. We turn now to our own Gary Fife with native news across the nation. I need some sugar, John, for my berries. Here you go, Jeannie. While John and Jeannie are busy with native subsistence, this is native news across the nation. I'm Gary Fife. Another major metropolitan newspaper has adopted a policy against the use of sports teams' names and logos that some Native Americans find offensive. Indian Country Today reported this month that the Minneapolis Star Tribune is the latest to implement those changes. Under the paper's new policy, they would ban such names as Redskins, Braves, Indians, and Chiefs at all levels, going from high schools all the way up through professional ranks. The paper will continue the use of tribal names such as Seminoles, but those names will be used in a respectful manner, they say. In an open letter to its readers, the paper declared that theirs was not a quick decision and was made after consultation with Native groups. On Capitol Hill, both the U.S. House and Senate have seen new bills to fight fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol effect. Both are birth defects affecting babies who are born to mothers who consumed alcohol during pregnancy and show up as severe mental and physical disorders. The bills contain provisions to create public health education programs to battle a disorder which is entirely preventable. It would also set up grants to help tribal and other governments do research, establish uh, information centers, and uh, spread the word that the rate of fetal alcohol syndrome among Native Americans is three times the national level. Nationally, the Centers for Disease Control estimate that there are at least 8,000 babies born in America who are damaged by the effects of alcohol. The prevention programs all say that pregnant women should not be drinking alcohol. 
Native elders in the Bethel region of Alaska are preparing to discuss plans for a Native Culture Center to be built there this fall. They'll be meeting in Tuxic Bay this coming week in connection with a meeting of the Association of Village Council Presidents. Although much of the discussion will focus on the actual business part of developing such a center, they'll also take some time to talk about what goes into it. The Tundra Drums reports plans include videotaping of crafts demonstrations, documenting, documenting stories and oral traditions, plus recording the philosophies of natives in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta area. Hopes are that such a native cultural center in Bethel will bring more tourists to the area and allow native craftspeople to do some direct marketing. It's a small start as college courses go, but it has made some impact and could offer a lucrative career to natives. It's an Associate of Arts degree in casino gambling being offered by the College of the Menominee Nation in Kashina, Wisconsin. Now in its third semester, the degree program trains Native Americans to run casinos on their own reservations. Currently, a large percentage of casinos being operated by tribes are using outside management companies to run them, and the Menominees are trying to change that. There are only 10 students enrolled in the course, but school officials are hoping to increase that number to 450. Their curriculum includes studies in gaming law, casino management, security, and personnel management. A Native group wants to highlight the plight of Native American homeless through a national drumming and singing effort to occur simultaneously across the nation. Elizabeth Wells of the Ori Drum Rite Walking Heritage is again asking that drumming and singing prayers be offered to end the plight of homeless Natives. Wells says the national drum call is set for March 12th. The time is set for 10.30 Eastern Time, 7.30 Pacific Time, and at 6.30 Alaska Time. Wells adds the drums and prayers are also to call attention to the fight against AIDS. And finally, a lot of people have claimed to have Cherokee blood and now national statistics confirm that a lot of them are correct. The tribal registrar for the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, headquartered in Tahlequah, says in 1983 the tribal rolls counted 41,400 Cherokee and now that number has swelled to 152,000. Registrar Lee Fleming says tribal enrollment increases during periods of economic hard times because many want to qualify for health and medical services offered to federally recognized tribal members. The Cherokee Report says population increases have averaged about 12,000 per year with 85 percent through newborns. But not everyone qualifies. About 5 percent of applicants are turned down. This is Native News Across the Nation and for Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Gary Fife, and Jeannie, save me some berries. No, I am not wearing blue lipstick. That's probably blue from the blueberries. <laughs> yeah. We turn now to the Bethel area. KYUK's John Active brings us this report. Thank you, Jeannie. Jamai, Alaska, Akumaugua, Kuyana Nijunika, Tagaluchi. Here's the latest news from Southwest Alaska. Despite bitter sub-zero wind chills, searchers haven't given up their efforts to recover the body of a Bethel man who went through the Kuskokwim River ice in his car two weeks ago. Volunteers have recovered 31-year-old Tony Hall's station wagon. They found no sign of Hall, only his dog Whiskey was inside. State troopers say the window on the driver's side was rolled down, a sign Hall tried to escape. Hall was last seen heading up the ice road on February 18th. A man driving behind Hall says he saw Hall turn off the main road just above Akiak, a village about 30 miles northeast of Bethel. From the tracks left behind, it appears he turned to avoid rough ice and drove straight into a huge open hole in the ice. About 30 volunteers turn out each day to help in the search. One came all the way from Hooper Bay to show searchers some underwater techniques that work in a search for two brothers who went through the ice on their snow machine near Imanach in December. In that search, volunteers dragged a bucket filled with weights with hooks attached to it to recover the bodies. When musher Mike Williams sets out on the Iditarod Trail in Anchorage this weekend, it'll be the third year in a row he'll be racing for sobriety. 
Williams will be carrying more than 10,000 signatures of people who have signed the Alaska Federation of Native Sobriety Movement pledge and pledge. Williams' message for this year's race is in his words, our hope is with the young people. Let's educate them and present them with the opportunities that become available when you become sober. Backers of the AFN sobriety movement and Mike Williams are asked to show their support by pledging at least one cent a mile for every mile Williams completes in the race. You can call 274-3611 to make your pledge. Many villages in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta may not have running water or roads yet, but many thanks to computers, modems, and satellites, they're may moving quickly into the future. The Bethel based Distance, Dis Distance Delivery Consortium is working to bring technology to the tundra. It's made up of about a dozen local agencies who have been working together to create a regional information highway. The consortium is testing new gadgets all the time. One recent pilot linked the Bethel Hospital to a health clinic in remote Kasigiluk. Rhonda McBride and photographer Dean Swope have the story. I'd have her take 250 milligrams TID. This is the radio traffic room at the Bethel Hospital, where doctors communicate daily with village health aides. Although doctors no longer use radios, the name for the room harks back to a time when there were no telephones in the villages. So why not rename this room the telephone traffic room? Well, hold on, because technology is about to make another leap. That old saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, has new meaning. This kind of apple is revolutionizing health care in the bush. Yeah, I would uh, change it to amoxicillin. As part of a pilot project, the Distance Delivery Consortium loaned computers to Dr. Pat Hannaway and the Casigula Clinic to test two new technologies, an electronic mail system and a two-way video telephone hookup. Before calling the Casigula Clinic, Dr. Hannaway checks the email. The health aides have already sent the doctor information by modem about patients they've seen. And that saved everyone quite a bit of time. Normally, the health aides read the information to the doctor over the phone, a slow and cumbersome process. This is an interesting note that um, I've circulated um, because I think people need to see this. And it's a note from the health aide saying, we just wanted to let you know that we really appreciate having the computer here in the clinic. We hope we can keep it for a while longer because it makes us easy. Next, Dr. Hannaway dials up the village on the computer modem. The Kasigaluk computer is equipped with a tiny camera, too. So when health aide Anna Tinker answers the phone, they can not only hear but see each other. Um, she was coughing all night. Okay. Did um, mom give her any, any medicines, any... Um, Tylenol or any uh, Jaitlok or any uh, Yupik medicines for to help this? Uh... They discuss a seven-year-old girl who has severe bronchitis. Dr. Hannaway suggests acupressure as one way to relieve the pain. That's right. You got it right there. And then the most important one, the one that helps most of the time, is not right on the cheekbone, but it's underneath more. Part of our mission is empowerment, and information empowers. Uh, information technologies, computers, email systems, video technologies, deliver more information faster. Clifford Hunt believes these new technologies will help give rural Alaska natives more control over their own health care. The, the state will shrink. I mean, just as the telephone shrunk the world, this technology is going to shrink the delta and uh, allow for faster transfer of data and more robust transfer of data. It won't just be a disembodied voice on the end of a phone line in another village. It will, it will be a much richer uh, body of information. There's a lot of opportunity for empowering the Yupi people to be able to take care of themselves. And we want to be, we want to try and help facilitate that and be caregivers and not try and take away and. It's really hard when you see someone in there, or you hear about someone in the village and you can't quite get a clear idea of what's going on 
and you say, well, they need to come into Bethel to be seen. And sometimes they'll say, um, we don't have any money to come in and be seen. It may be a while before the video technology is refined enough for the bush to use. It works better on conventional phone lines like they have in the lower 48. But here in the bush, our phone signals bounce off satellites, which slows down video transmission. But the electronic mail system seemed to work quite well and is perhaps the most promising of the new technologies. What we found was that the health aid really felt they were contributing more by generating the document beforehand and sending it off to the doctor. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Information allows for more informed choices. And if we're able to make more informed choices, we'll lead a healthier life, you know, whether that health is measured clinically or culturally or, or whatever. I'm going to just turn the camera now, and I need to get going and call the other health aides, too. So we'll let you say goodbye to Rhonda. And goodbye to Jean. Okay. Bye. And say bye to Yako Slim for me. I'll see you in a couple right. weeks. Okay. Bira. Next week in our KYK report, we'll take you to Kasigluk again to the Akula School's annual dance festival. And we'll also check out the George Morgan High School's Cultural Heritage Week in Kalskag. Boy, I wish I was there to taste some of that native food from Kalskag. Myself, I'm going home for herring eggs, walrus flippers, and fermented fish heads. Mwah. Reporting from KYK in Bethel, I'm John Active. Thank you so much for that report from KYUK TV in Bethel. If you just tuned in, you're wondering what's going on on the Heartbeat Alaska set. Well, we just busted open a nice box of native food, and we've got salmon berries and blueberries and seal oil and dry fish, and we thought we'd share it with everybody because it's such a such a special thing. Thank you so much, Shirley Goldie. We'll be back with more news from Heartbeat Alaska right after these messages. During the Roman era, 28 was considered old. In the 1800s, 60 was over the hill. Ah, you got it! or information from your community that you would like to share with our viewers, please contact Heartbeat Alaska at 2611 Fairbanks Street, Suite D, Anchorage, Alaska, 99503, or give us a call at area code 907-272-8111, or fax us 272-7005. John, you were talking about earlier that your home is in Shaktulik. Now, John Tepon's from, originally he was born in Shaktulik. And you just recently returned from Barrow, and he said he had tons and tons of native food up there. And you said it was richer. Why is that? I think it's because the bowhead whale, which is the main staple food mm -hmm. uh, of, of uh, the inner bass up there, is richer because people have to survive in the kind of environment they do. The weather, the weather can be awesome. And I'm, we're talking about wind chill factors to 100 below. Mm -hmm. And before, you know, before ha we, they had electricity and, and uh, uh, natural gas, they lived under, in sod houses, sort of un under, yeah. semi-underneath semi the ground. But I think when people had to hunt in the elements, in the, in the wind, in the cold, you got to have food that'll sustain a person. Yes. And that food does. I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you what it does. Well, this is going to sustain us through the next report from the North Slope Borough, speaking of the top of the world. Good evening. I'm Tina Coro and bringing you news from the North Slope. 
On February 19, the North Slope Borough's Health Department, led by Larry Sievers and Edith Nesholuk of the Health Education Division, brought a health fair to the village of Wainwright. The purpose of the fair was to bring health information and some simple tests to the villages in a setting where everyone could have some fun while getting screened for basic health problems. Staff from almost all the divisions within the health department attended the fair as volunteers to assist with various programs. Villagers were able to get their blood drawn to check for cholesterol levels, diabetes, and even AIDS. Simple eye exams were available and the dental department did oral checks. Participants could have their blood pressure tested or find out their blood type. Meanwhile, other departments brought lots of printed material to hand out on everything from hepatitis A to good nutrition and healthy pregnancies. There were balloons as well as door prizes. The prizes ranged from free field drums donated by Ulurne Corporation, Wayne Rides Village Corporation, to two round trip tickets for flights donated by Cape Smart Air Service. Ulurnek also donated sandwiches, chips, and pop to all the volunteers working at the fair. The fair was considered quite special because for the first time the Arctic Slope Native Association, also known as ASNA, participated. Staff from ASNA spoke about the emergency travel fund they operate as well as explaining the role they play in child welfare situations based on the Indian Child Welfare Act. Also, for the first time, the Boroughs Employee Assistance Program had staff in attendance to discuss the counseling, mediation, and referral services they offer. Before the end of September 1994, the Health Department plans to bring health care to every village on the North Slope. Recently at UIC Narl Museum, there's been a new attraction catching everyone's eye. In addition to the newly renovated museum and numerous exhibits, there are three new aquariums. Two of the aquariums contain saltwater creatures and one contains freshwater fish. David Norton, associate professor of natural sciences at the Arctic Civil Moon Ilisagvi College, created this exhibit. Norton said that this idea resulted after research was performed in 1990 on a bluff that had fallen off near a residential home. It revealed bone middens associated with the frozen family found there. Bone middens are garbage heaps created by the people of the frozen family. Norton wanted to create an archive of animal skeletons common to the Arctic. The aquariums are the result of his attempts to prepare the skeletons locally. Creatures that strip flesh off carcasses are called amphipods, a small shrimp-like creature. Dave thought there should be some way to bring them indoors and have them cleaned off carcasses locally. The first six months of the aquarium was a learning experience as Dave tried to determine the proper mix of bacteria, plants, and animals. Initially, ammonia buildup in the water was a big problem, but natural kelp eventually stabilized the chemical condition of the tank. We've been, we've been getting a number of invertebrates, things like soft corals, starfishes, um, quite, a, quite a number of different species of starfishes, worms from the seafloor, uh, tunicates. Among the worms, there's a species that has never been fully described by science before. It's in its own phylum. Uh, big numbers of those washed ashore on the Chukchi Sea coast in September of 1993 during fall storms. We've also had a number of species of bony fishes, sculpins, Arctic flounders, um, nine spine sticklebacks, uh, and they've done very well. The aquariums contain a wide variety of materials from the floor of the Arctic Ocean. This spring, Dave hopes to replenish the tanks with new materials. He's not trying to use it for cleaning carcasses yet, because right now everyone is too fascinated by the diversity of materials they are pulling up and displaying in the cases. The tanks have contained everything from peanut worms to an octopus and jellyfish. Jellyfish, however, don't seem to survive very well. Later, Norton hopes to concentrate on getting a lot of amphipods into the tank and go back to the original idea of using them to strip the flesh off animal and bird remains. Dave says there is commercial value in this since there is a thriving market for skeletal materials needed by museums and teaching institutions. If the aquarium never does anything more than bring a look of wonder and learning on the face of young and old alike, it will have served a good purpose. For Heartbeat Alaska and the North Slope Borough, I'm Tina Corwin. Clean up buck.
We turn now to Fairbanks, where native dance groups from all over the state met last week for the largest dance festival in the state. It's organized by the University of Alaska in Fairbanks native students and their faculty in order to promote tradition and participation in Alaska arts. Dennis Eames has more. And I want some more of those berries. Where Here. are they? I'm not going to eat <laughs> Natives from around the state gathered in Fairbanks last weekend to celebrate their Alaskan heritage and to watch Athabascan, Tlingit, Inupiat, and Yupik dance troops. According to Festival of Native Arts faculty advisor Jim Rupert, this was one of the biggest festivals yet. This year we have one of the largest uh, selection of groups. We're going to have 18 groups from, from all over uh, expressing uh, different cultural traditions of Alaska. In addition to dancing, the festival gives native craftspersons a chance to display and sell their traditional work. Rupert says that this festival and others like it are helping to revitalize native dance traditions. For a number of years they were um, disapproved by many religious groups uh, and many communities stopped doing dances. So one of the main goals of the festival is to encourage communities to, se to set up their own dance groups and to revitalize their traditions. According to UAF assistant professor James Nugget, the festival is important because it encourages young people to learn and participate in their native traditions. Because of this uh, festival of native arts, there are new groups coming up. When the, when the students get home, they get more involved in some cultural activities. Other than just um, performing in a dance group, but doing some subsistence hunting, and gathering and learning about the, uh, the nature of the animals. The highlight for many children was the opportunity to climb on stage themselves and to dance with the performers. Alaska. This is Dennis Eames. Thank you so much for joining us for another Heartbeat Alaska. John, you sure worked hard. Mm, I did. I did. <laughs> I worked hard eating. <laughs> I'd like to encourage you to please send your video in. I'm always looking for news from your village or community. Whatever is news to you is news to us. Give me a call and we'll try and get your story on the air. For Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Jeannie Green. I, before I go, I want to say hello to our good viewers in Yakutat. Also, thank you so much for our viewers in Window Rock, Arizona. Please do the same thing that our Alaska viewers do. If you have a camcorder, get out and a recorder of, record the event. And just give me a call at area code 907-272-8111, and we'll do our best to get your news on the air as well. That's what we're here for, right, John? Right on. Okay. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's fantastic. All right, I want some more of this. Would you do Dum-dum-dum-dum-dum Dum-dum-dum-dum